Hey, 42 here. If you've been flicking through social media recently, tuned into any Netflix documentary, or perused a plethora of podcasts, you're probably confused about what you should be eating. According to some expert influencers, you should be a vegetarian, pescatarian, insect-eating, meat-eating vegan who avoids seed oils, sugar, acid, dairy, and fun. Confusing, isn't it? But I want to forget all the fads and hush the hype to answer a really simple question at the bottom of it all that I don't think is talked about enough. What are humans actually meant to eat? Foregoing any agenda, let's explore our ancestral roots and follow them all the way to the modern day and delve into what the body responds well to and what it doesn't. And at the end of this surprising journey, I promise you, we will have an answer, but fair warning, you might not like it. So then, I think the best place to start is at the beginning. The very, very beginning. Early hominids first appeared about 7 million years ago. We don't know much about our ancestors from this time, but fossils of Sahalentropus, 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 but fossils of Sahalentropus chadensis, the earliest hominids, have been found exhibiting small teeth with thick enamel, suggesting they occasionally ate small amounts of hard food like nuts and seeds. But primarily, their diet consisted of softer foods, fruits, leaves, insects, and occasionally meat. Although if they ate meat, it would have been small creatures such as mice, rats, birds, fish, and small reptiles. The hominid diet remained the same for the next few million years, until Lucy came and spoilt it all by saying something stupid like, I want to eat tubers. Tubers would have been a difficult eat for earlier species, since we hadn't yet discovered cooking to soften them. In 1974 in Ethiopia, several hundred pieces of fossilised bone were discovered and dated to about 3.2 million years ago. She was named Lucy, and she's one of the best preserved examples we've ever found of Australopithecus, a genus of hominid that existed between 4 to 3 million years ago. Lucy filled in a lot of evolutionary blanks for us. Notably, she showed a huge improvement in the structure of the jaw and teeth. Australopithecus would have been able to eat far more nuts and seeds than Sahalanthropus and hard uncooked vegetables like tubers. They would have also been able to process tougher, slightly larger pieces of meat if they could scavenge it. Speaking of which, we didn't start hunting for meat until 2 million years ago when Homo erectus first erected itself onto the planet. This species was a significant turning point. Homo erectus was taller, had a larger brain, and was more dexterous than its predecessors. These traits allowed them to develop more sophisticated tools, enabling them to hunt and process meat more efficiently. Fossil evidence shows clear signs of butchery on small animal bones dating back to this era, suggesting at this time we ate meat with more regularity. But the biggest change to our ancestors' diet came after we learnt to control fire. For a long time, we thought that this happened about 400,000 years ago, but ash found in caves in South Africa suggests it was actually about 1.5 million years ago. Cooking food kills parasites, prolonging our lifespans. Cooked food has to be chewed less, so there was a steady decrease in our jaw size after this era. The gut also grew smaller because it didn't need to use as much energy to digest food. And fibrous root vegetables were now on the menu more often, as were tough and chewy lean meats such as game. The effect of increased meat consumption was profound. It's believed that the high quality nutrients found in meat played a crucial role in the evolution of our larger, more complex brains. Meat is more energy dense than plants and is high in B12, zinc and iron, which are all crucial for brain development. Generally though, cooking allowed for greater nutrient absorption of all food types, leading to a much faster development of the species. Then things continued pretty much the same for the next million years, until about 10,000 years ago, when the advent of agriculture marks the biggest change in the diet of Homo sapiens. We left our nomadic lifestyle of hunting and gathering behind for one of farming and settling in one place. 
Prior to the development of agriculture, the human diet had to be adapted to the environment we found ourselves in. Populations living near bodies of water would have had a diet richer in fish and seaweed, whilst those in forested areas would have eaten more fruits, nuts and game. But in a post-agricultural world, we could now, for the first time in history, adapt the environment to us. Within a few short centuries, the amount of forest food in our diets dropped precipitously. We began to eat far less nuts, seeds, wild fruits, and game meat. In their place was grain, more grain than you could shake a sheaf of wheat at. A grain-based diet can support a much larger population per square mile than hunting and foraging. So this is when Homo sapiens started spreading across the globe and our numbers grew exponentially. But agriculture wasn't necessarily a good thing. We were less healthy than ever before. Early agriculture was lacking in quite a few important <laughs> nutrients, specifically vitamins A and C, which are prevalent in vegetables and fruits, and B12 and omega-3 fatty acids, which are found in meat and fish. These elements were all severely lacking in this new grain-based diet, which was also a high-carbohydrate diet, which, as we'll discover, gives you lots of energy, but lacks in nutritional value. <coughs> We had conquered the environment. We had made it our slave. And as a result, we became unhealthy slops. Skeletal remains from this period show an increase in dental problems like cavities and gum disease, conditions that were rare amongst hunter-gatherer populations. There was a reduction in average stature and an increase in signs of malnutrition and diseases related to nutritional deficiencies. But something else rather interesting happened during this time. Our genes changed. Seriously, specifically, most human cultures, but not all, rather quickly, in the timeline of evolution at least, developed lactase persistence. A fascinating genetic adaptation that allowed some human population groups to digest lactose into adulthood, something we couldn't easily do before. This trait is a direct and rather rapid consequence of the domestication of dairy animals. It's a stellar example of how the development of agriculture, even in the short space of 10,000 years, has etched a permanent mark into our DNA. This tells us that human genetics have flexibility, and who knows what new food trends we will adapt to in the next few thousand years. Now, agriculture may have made us less healthy than ever before, but you may think that this trend was reversed at some point. After all, with the advent of the middle class in the 18th century, more people were eating a varied agricultural diet than ever before. Gone were the days of bread and gruel for breakfast, lunch and supper, and it was in with the various farmyard meats, farm-grown fruits and vegetables, and complex carbohydrates, nuts, seeds, and pulses. And an increase in preserved food meant better nutrition throughout the winter too. And yes, all of this helped. We started to regain and even surpass those standards of nutrition and health that we left behind in our hunter-gatherer days. And in developed nations, life expectancies broke through unprecedented barriers. Trouble was, this only happened in areas of the world that had a middle class, and therefore had access to such a varied, nutritious diet. And then, of course, there was the Great Plague on the horizon. <coughs> Not the Black Death, but something much worse. A plague that, once it had seeped its tendrils into society, it began to rust us away from our very core. The Plague of Processed Food. Now, I'm not going to rant on about the evils of processed food here, because we've all been lectured about it more than we probably care for at this point. But one thing is for certain. As processed food has proliferated throughout the world, obesity has skyrocketed. Multiple meta-analyses over the past decades have found a strong link between so-called ultra-processed foods and an increased risk of heart disease, stroke, and premature death. So, we've established what we've been eating for the past 7 million years, and how the human diet has shifted during that time. But we still haven't answered the most important question. What should humans be eating today? To answer this, I'm going to attack it on two fronts. Human physiology 
and nutritional needs. So let's start with the physiology. Consider our digestive tract. The length and complexity of an animal's gastrointestinal tract are intrinsically linked to its diet. Herbivorous animals, such as cows, have long, complex digestive systems that include multiple stomach chambers or a lengthy colon. Plant materials like grasses and leaves are hard to break down, and cellulose, which is found in plants, requires prolonged fermentation to efficiently extract the nutrients. Some herbivorous animals even have to regurgitate their food and reconsume it or eat their own feces because one pass through their GI tract is insufficient. Herbivores also have to eat constantly through the day to consume enough daily nutrients. Conversely, humans can eat thrice, twice or once per day, or even once every couple of days, and still extract sufficient nutrients. The shorter colon of Homo sapiens compared to herbivores suggests it has evolved to consume meat. Although it's not as short as a carnivore's, which makes sense since we're somewhere in the middle. We're omnivores. Humans also have a very high level of stomach acidity compared to other omnivores, and even more so than some carnivores. This is an evolutionary byproduct of eating meat, since strong stomach acids are necessary for killing bacteria that can proliferate on meat. The human pancreas also produces special enzymes that are proficient at breaking down proteins and fats. Put all this together and Homo sapiens are, of all the omnivores, one of the most well adapted for meat consumption. The human diet is also imprinted, in a really obvious way, into our teeth. We have molars for grinding and canines for tearing. As omnivores, this gives us a level of flexibility that is rarely seen in the animal kingdom, allowing us to process both tough plants and meats. That's our physiology in a nutshell. But what does our body actually need? If your body is an engine, exactly what mix of fuels does it require to function with maximum power and efficiency? Well, the body's fuel mix can be divided into two categories, macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients are like the petrol for our engine. The body needs these continually in reserve to keep running. Micronutrients, on the other hand, are like engine oil. They lubricate the engine, ensuring everything runs smoothly. As for the macronutrients, there are three. Carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Carbohydrates are the body's main energy source. Proteins and fats can also be used as energy, but they're more complex and difficult to break down. Carbs are easy, quick energy that are broken down into glucose in the body, which is the primary energy source for your brain and muscles. Carbs also have a protein sparing effect. The body will opt to use carbs for fuel instead of breaking down proteins, which could otherwise be used for vital bodily functions and to repair tissue. But as we all know by now, carbs have an ugly side. Carbs are essential for our energy needs, but eat too many and suffer the side effects. Any carbs that aren't used for energy, whether it be intensive exercise or just walking about, are stored as glycogen in the liver and muscles. The liver stores about 100 grams of glycogen and the muscles 400 grams. This is all fine because it can be used for energy later on. But when the glycogen stores are already full and further carbs are consumed, it is instead converted into fat and stored around the body as adipose tissue, which is a fancy word for the wobbly bits. Also, excessive carb intake, especially simple carbs like sugar and basically everything tasty, causes your blood sugar levels to spike. Insulin is released to remove this excess glucose from the bloodstream, but if this behavior is repeated over a prolonged period, you can develop insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So, the TLDR of carbohydrates is this. We should be eating them, since your body does need them for energy, but eating too many, especially crappy carbs, leads to diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and that old favorite, death. Then there's proteins, the wunderkind of the macronutrients, the favorite child. Proteins are the building blocks of life, 
Your muscles, bones, skin, hair, and pretty much everything else needs proteins to regenerate. Your muscles are made up of tiny strands of protein called myofibrils. These are torn when you exercise, and you need protein in your body to fuse them back together. And when you cut yourself, collagen, the most abundant protein in your body, is used to create a scaffold on which new tissue can grow to close the wound. Proteins also regulate your immune system. They create enzymes, prevent blood clots, transport and store nutrients, maintain your fluid balance and acid levels. And in a pinch, they can be used for energy when your carbohydrate and fat stores are depleted. So to ask if the body needs protein would be like asking if a scone needs cream. The answer is yes, by the way, unless you're completely mental. Government guidelines in the UK and US recommend about 55 grams of protein a day, or 45 grams for women. But recent research suggests that athletes, weightlifters, and the elderly who suffer from muscle loss should all be eating much more protein. Anyone who participates in regular exercise or does resistance training should be consuming 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. For most men, that's at least 110 grams per day. But here's the strange thing. Not all protein is created equally, and protein quality is more important than protein quantity. For efficient protein synthesis, the process of repairing tissue and building muscle, the body needs complete proteins. That's proteins that contain all nine of the essential amino acids in roughly equal amounts. There's actually a number to objectively measure protein quality. The higher the dias, the more of that protein your body actually absorbs and uses. Higher is better. The foods with the highest dias are all animal-based, such as pork, chicken, beef, eggs, and whey protein, which comes from milk. So don't be fooled by the protein content of plant-based foods such as peas, oats, and soy. You may consume 50 grams of pea protein, but your body won't be able to use all 50 grams due to those proteins containing imbalanced amino acids, whereas 50 grams of chicken protein will be fully utilized by the body. Lastly, there's fats, often misunderstood and unfairly vilified. Fats are essential for the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. They're also crucial for brain health. Fats come in three flavors, saturated, unsaturated, and trans fats. Saturated fats, found in animal products and some plant oils, were once deemed the bad guys, thought to clog arteries and increase risk of heart disease. And truth be told, the jury's still out on that one. However, newer research suggests that the story's a bit more complex. Your body actually needs saturated fats, but the trick is to balance them with unsaturated, the so-called good fats. Monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats are found in foods like olive oil, avocados, nuts, and fish. They are the champions of good heart health, helping to lower bad cholesterol levels, reduce inflammation, and they've been linked to a lower risk of heart disease. Omega-free fatty acids, a typical polyunsaturated fat found abundantly in fatty fish, are particularly beneficial for brain function and reduce the risks of depression, dementia, and arthritis. And then there are trans fats, the true villains. These are mostly artificial fats, created in an industrial process that adds hydrogen to liquid vegetable oils to make them more solid. Trans fats are found in many fried foods, baked goods, and processed snacks. They're associated with an increased risk of heart disease and, like lutein, should generally be avoided as much as possible. Dietary guidelines recommend that 20 to 35% of your daily calorie intake should come from fats, predominantly unsaturated. So the human body needs carbohydrates, fats, and most of all, proteins to function. But remember, there are the other fuels in the mix, micronutrients. Micronutrients are divided into vitamins and minerals, such as iron, zinc, calcium, and potassium. Vitamins are organic compounds that are essential for bodily functions, such as immune response. Vitamins A, D, E, and K are all fat-soluble and are stored in the body if eaten at least somewhat irregularly. 
whereas the various B vitamins and vitamin C cannot be stored in large amounts and therefore have to be eaten on a regular basis for efficient brain and body development. Vitamins all play a crucial role and each of them does something for us, whether it's vitamin D for bone health or vitamin A for vision and immune support. But what does this mean for our diets? In trying to figure out what humans need to eat, we should surely be eating the foods that give us a healthy balance of all the vitamins. And a quick side note, notice I said foods, not supplements. Healthy individuals can get all the vitamins and minerals they need from eating food alone. Furthermore, it's generally recommended to get all your vitamins and minerals from food rather than supplements unless your doctor has recommended to the contrary. Anyway, let's get back to those vitamins. So vitamin A is found primarily in fish oils and dairy products, as well as eggs, spinach, and kale. Vitamin D is a similar story. Look at fatty fish, egg yolks, mushrooms, and red meat. Vitamin E, surprise, surprise, is also found in fish, but it's also present in almonds, sunflower seeds, and pine nuts. Vitamin K is the king of leafy greens. You'll find it in pretty much every dark green plant. Broccoli, kale, Swiss chard, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, etc. Vitamin C comes from citrus fruits, blackcurrants, strawberries, and some green vegetables. And finally, there are the various B vitamins. There are eight of them, and they can be mostly found in animal products. Meat, cheese, milk, eggs, etc. However, there's one particular vitamin that holds a unique clue in our journey to find out what humans should eat. B12 is a really interesting vitamin because it is the only one that can only be found in significant amounts in animal products. B12 can be found in high amounts in all types of meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. This is because it's uniquely synthesized by bacteria that only live in the guts of animals. There are no plant foods that are significant natural sources of B12. That presents a bit of a problem for people who wish to pursue a meat-free diet, because B12 simply can't be skipped. It is absolutely essential to our development and survival as humans. B12 is needed for red blood cell formation, and a deficiency often leads to anemia. B12 is also crucial for brain development and ongoing brain health, as well as heart health. A lack of B12 has also been linked to an increased risk of depression and anxiety. Although these days many non-animal food products are artificially fortified with B12 to alleviate these issues in those with low or no meat diets. However, B12 is one of the clearest signals we have that, from a purely evolutionary point of view, without any moral consideration or otherwise, that humans should be eating meat and other animal products. So then, we know what our bodies need and we know what we've been eating for millions of years. Can we finally now answer that question, what should humans eat? Well, if I absolutely had to give an answer, it would probably be this. Whatever works for you. I think it's really important that we educate ourselves on our biological requirements and make sure we cover all our bases with our diets, avoiding overconsumption of any one food group. But the truth is that everyone is different, not just in beliefs, morals and tastes, but physiologically. The Personalized Nutrition Project was a large-scale study conducted in Israel in 2015 in which the blood sugar levels of 800 participants were tracked after eating. What they discovered is that no one diet fits all. Everyone's bodies respond differently to the same foods. Ice cream may cause one person's blood sugar to spike, but the same ice cream could have no significant effect on another individual. This is important to note because elevated blood sugar levels have long been linked to weight gain, heart disease, and diabetes. Interestingly, they also found that how people's blood sugar levels reacted depended largely on the health of their gut microbiome. Those with healthy levels of good gut bacteria could better tolerate high sugar foods. But that's a topic for another day. The Personalized Nutrition Project is just one study within a new and emerging field of science called nutrigenomics. Nutrigenomics aims to discover exactly why people react differently to different foods and diets. 
It explores how the presence of specific gene mutations in some people affects what they should be optimally eating. Nutrigenomic research is quite new and a little patchy, but it has already identified genetic variants, such as the MTHFR mutation, which affects folate metabolism and has implications for cardiovascular health and pregnancy. They've also found a gene that determines how well or how poorly caffeine works on you. It's called CYP1A2. If caffeine doesn't give you a perk like most other people, you probably have the fast metabolizing version of this gene. By analyzing these various genetic markers, and many more we've yet to discover, Nutrigenomics aims to personalize nutrition advice, moving beyond a one-size-fits-all dietary recommendation to create bespoke diets that cater to individual genetic profiles just imagine sending off your blood to some Silicon Valley company only to get the results in an app, telling you exactly how certain foods affect you personally and offering a DNA-specific diet. After having said all this, I'm not comfortable leaving the answer to what should humans eat on whatever you fancy. Although it's true to a large extent, it feels rather unscientific, especially after everything we've learned in this video. So if I absolutely had to give an answer just based on my research, then I suppose I'd have to ask the question, when were humans at our healthiest? If we look at the timeline of our existence, when could we pinpoint the epoch of optimal nutrition for humankind? To answer this, we first need to completely disregard lifespan as a factor. Average lifespans in developed countries have almost doubled in the past 100 years. But that has been driven primarily by medical advancements and a better understanding of general health, not by diet. Well, thankfully for me, a huge amount of research has already been put into answering the question of when was optimal human nutrition. And although there is still ongoing debate and probably always will be, the overwhelming consensus amongst researchers, scientists and dietitians is that we were at our healthiest when we were hunter-gatherers, also known as the Paleolithic era, which roughly spanned 2.5 million years ago to 10,000 years ago, just before the advent of agriculture, when we basically f***ed everything up. Some researchers suggest that as hunter-gatherers, our diets were the most in line with our evolutionary adaptations as they ever have been. That is to say, in every way our body had evolved to desire, process and accept foods and nutrients, during the Paleolithic era, we were meeting those goals. And we also didn't eat anything at that time that was particularly difficult for our bodies to process, because grain and processed foods didn't exist yet. Our diets consisted mostly of lean meats, fish, eggs, nuts, seeds, fruits and vegetables. This is why there are so many modern day proponents of the paleo diet, which advocates eating those exact things and avoiding modern conveniences such as wheat and any foods with refined sugar such as sweet soft drinks, etc. It sounds simple and that's because it is. Although I don't particularly like the term paleo diet because it's not a diet at all. It's just a mode of eating akin to that which we've evolved to do so over millions of years. And it seems to be working. There are early indications that the paleo diet has shown reductions in chronic diseases by those who follow it. But I would argue that there's a slightly healthier diet out there. And a lifestyle that better suits our tastes as modern humans, which still provides all the benefits of the paleo diet and a little more. So, ultimately, if I had to answer the question, what are humans meant to eat? This diet would be my answer, my final answer. And please note, this is just my personal opinion that I've derived based on the research I've done. Ask anyone else and they could answer differently. Now, some of you might have already guessed what I'm about to say. Yeah, it's the Mediterranean diet. Yes, yes, I know you've heard all about it time and time again, but it turns out there are a hundred good reasons for that. You see, the paleo diet may be pretty great and all, but humans are ultimately creatures of habit and we're extremely susceptible to temptation. 
And that's a bit of a problem, because the paleo diet is really very limiting. Namely, it cuts out two of modern humanity's greatest inventions, wheat and cheese. The paleo diet forbids the consumption of dairy and anything made from grain, like breads and pastries. Last time I checked, those were all the delicious things. Because those are post-agricultural inventions, and they were not eaten by hunter-gatherers. But the Mediterranean diet has managed to magically fuse the best elements of the paleo diet with the wonders of agriculture in a beautiful blend of good food and world-leading health. The Mediterranean diet, which is primarily the diet of Italy, Greece and Spain, just like the paleo diet, champions the consumption of whole foods in their natural, unadulterated, unprocessed state. However, the Mediterranean diet expands the culinary palate of paleo with the addition of whole grains, legumes and dairy products. Particularly fermented ones like cheese and yoghurt, which are great for your gut health. These additions not only provide a wider variety of flavours and textures, but also bring in essential nutrients that might be less abundant in a strict paleo diet. For example, whole grains and legumes are excellent sources of dietary fibre, B vitamins and minerals like iron and magnesium. And sourdough bread and dairy products, both of which are extremely common in the med, but completely excluded from the paleo, are fantastic probiotics which improve the health of your gut microbiome. Something which is increasingly proving to be one of the pillars of overall gut health. Probably the hallmark of the Mediterranean diet is its emphasis on healthy fats. Olive oil and fish are pretty much eaten daily. We get monounsaturated fats from olive oil and polyunsaturated fats and omega-3 from fatty fish. These fats are not only heart healthy but also aid the absorption of fat soluble vitamins, enhancing the nutritional value of all other food consumed. Furthermore, the Mediterraneans famously love their red wine, drinking it almost daily. Red wine is packed with a phenol called resveratrol, which increases good cholesterol levels and has a neuroprotective effect, shielding the brain from degeneration. But for me, the biggest benefit to living by the Mediterranean diet is that it tastes fucking amazing, and it's simply a joy to eat. And most of all, apart from avoiding processed foods, it's pretty much unrestricted. I'm a big believer that any restrictive diet we place upon ourselves ultimately degrades our enjoyment of food and makes it harder to stick to said diet. And the results speak for themselves. As of 2023, Italy and Spain are both ranked in the top 10 worldwide for life expectancy. And the Italian island of Sardinia is one of only five blue zones in the world. Regions where people regularly live to over 100. In conclusion, there is no one-size-fits-all answer to what should humans eat. A diet that includes a variety of whole foods, is rich in fruits, vegetables, healthy fats and proteins, and is adaptable to individual needs and preferences, seems to be the closest we can get to a so-called optimal human diet. But remember, what's optimal for one person might not work for you. And ultimately, all you can do is inform yourself about how what you eat affects your body and then eat whatever you think will make you happy and healthy. So to wrap things up, if I really had to answer the question, what are humans meant to eat? I would say this. The same damn thing we've been eating for thousands if not millions of years. And it's my hope that this video has given you a brief overview as to what that might be. After all, it's worked pretty bloody well for us up to this point. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Just a quick word to say that I couldn't make these videos without the support of my Patreon members. Consider joining the exclusive 42 Discord community by supporting me on Patreon. It's a great place to discuss my videos with like-minded individuals and myself. The link's in the description, but if you don't want to, or you can't join my Patreon, then please don't worry. A simple like or comment to say thanks would also put a huge smile on my face. Thank you.